I wonder if you've ever found yourself in a place you don't belong. When I was a freshman in high school, I was just going about the first day of classes, kind of going from class to class, and I entered what I thought was my freshman science class. I wasn't necessarily uh, an overachiever in high school, but somehow I made it to class before anybody else was in the room. And as I was just kind of making myself settled, I noticed as people were coming in the room that I noticed some upperclassmen friends I have. And I thought to myself, I wonder why they're taking freshman science. Now, remember, I grew up in Kentucky, right? And so maybe we have a reputation of repeating a few things over and over. In fact, fast forward to my senior year, I was taking a very simple math class with one of my friends who was 19 who had failed the class twice and needed it to graduate, all right? Now back to the story. I didn't realize anything was wrong until the teacher came in and welcomed the class and then I realized that I was in the wrong spot. And as sheepishly as I tried to sneak out of the room quietly, that was not possible. I ended up walking out to much of their uh, humor, right? I wonder if you've ever realized that you might be surrounded right now in this very moment in a place that you might not belong. And I'm not referring to the four walls of this church building. I'm actually talking about the culture that surrounds us right now. I don't know if you've noticed, but we actually live in a culture today that basically has denied the existence of creation by God. It's dismissed the word of God as irrelevant or impractical. It's kind of made a mockery of everything that's holy and right. In fact, anything and everything that has to do about Jesus or his church seems to be a target of abuse by most of the world around us. And here's the harsh reality. There are many people who would call themselves followers of Jesus who haven't even noticed. Or maybe they have just kind of fit in snugly and don't even realize it right now. That's the harsh reality that we have to recognize, that we are surrounded in a place that we were never created to belong. There's a widening gap between two worlds, God's kingdom and the kingdom of this world. And it's time that we wake up and recognize how far that chasm really is and where we should find our allegiance. As I was praying about this whole year, 2024, and how to help our congregation live and love more like Jesus, I was really convicted about this reality and how to help equip us to navigate the fact that this is not our home. And I felt led to a biblical narrative found in the Old Testament that captures actually the life of a man named Daniel. It was the book actually just shares his life story. It's given the name Daniel because he's the one who wrote it. And I thought it might be helpful as we just kind of dig deep into his life and the events of his life and the way that God was at work in and through his life, that that might help us begin to navigate the world around us, the culture that seems so pressing in on us in every moment, in every decision we make, everything about our lives. And to help us realize that this is not our home. If you have a copy of the book of the Bible or you want to use the one in the seat back in front of you, I'd encourage you to turn to the book of Daniel. It's about midway through the Old Testament after Psalms. You'll find it um, between there and the beginning of the New Testament. There are many relevant themes that are kind of woven through the book of Daniel. And one of those themes that we want to look at today specifically, begin to lay a foundation for the rest of our study of the book of Daniel, is the sovereignty of God. God's capable, constant care and control of all things, regardless of what may be happening at any moment in history. And the first chapter of Daniel provides a very strong historical and theological backdrop to provide context for just where Daniel finds himself. Look how it begins in Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It reads, In the third year of the king of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. It's necessary to understand that the events that are recorded in these first two verses didn't happen by accident. They were actually fulfillments of prophecies that go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapters 28 through 31, where Moses warned God's people, the nation of Israel, 
That if they obeyed God and followed his instructions and lived in the covenant relationship he was making with them, then they would enter a land that was described as a land flowing with milk and honey. And they would enjoy his blessings and all that he provided. But if they disobeyed God and abandoned his instructions as well as his covenant with them, then they would be taken captive and exiled. And that's exactly what happened to the northern tribes, the 10 tribes of Israel, known as Israel. And that's exactly what we're reading about happening to the remaining two tribes of Israel, known as Judah. And Nebuchadnezzar, well, he was a bloodthirsty ruler who, while his dad was in power, led many victorious campaigns, most recently against Egypt, which led him down to the Sinai region, the nation of Israel and Judah. And I wonder if you caught what was recorded. In verse 2, it says this, The Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. God's sovereignty is exhibited by allowing Judah to be conquered. It wasn't accidental or out of his control or something that even surprised him. Did he cause it? No. The people of Judah caused it because of their wicked and evil behavior. And God was faithful to his promises that they basically got what they were asking for, what they deserved. Did he allow it? Yes, he allowed it. Could he have prevented it? Yes, he could have prevented it. So why didn't he? Why didn't God stop the people that he loved from being overtaken? Well, I think the rest of the book will draw us a pretty big picture and give us some perspective while probably not providing every answer. You know, when bad things happen in our lives, we must choose to trust the sovereignty of God and turn to him to find our comfort and our peace and maybe to gain some perspective that might bring us direction as we move forward. We might not always get all of our questions answered, but we must choose to trust him, his wisdom, and his love. It's interesting what Nebuchadnezzar did. What Nebuchadnezzar did is he took some of the sacred articles from the temple of God, capital G, and put it in the temple of his God, little g. And that was to indicate that he had conquered those from Judah, their city, and he thought he had conquered their God. As another sign of conquest, Nebuchadnezzar selected some of the best people of Judah to become part of his kingdom. Look at what it says in verse 3. It says, then the king ordered Aspenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Now, this was quite a group of people that the king asked his official to identify. They were, first of all, part of the royal family and nobility of the people of Judah. They were part of people who were in leadership and power. They were privileged and pampered, maybe more than others in their country. They were young, most likely in their mid to late teens, much like Ezra Tony, who was helping lead us, in wor- lead us in worship just this few moments ago. They were without physical defect. They were handsome, maybe like Ryan King, who often is part of our teaching team. They were quick to learn, smart. They were, had aptitude for learning, maybe a little bit like Andrew Bondurant, right? Stand out in all ways were these people that the king had selected. And the king wanted to educate them, probably better said, indoctrinate these young men into the ways of Babylonia, teaching them the language, the culture, the customs of their new surroundings. And he wanted them to be well taken care of, providing them food and wine that he would eat, the best of the best. He wanted them to be trained well and taken care of well so that they could serve him well. And this is where we meet Daniel. He was one of the chosen says, among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These young men met the king's criteria, and they were taken into the service of the king, and they were given this royal treatment, so they would be equipped to perform well for their new ruler. If you've ever been in Sunday school or maybe watched some of the Veggie Tales as a kid or with your kids, you might recognize some new names that the king gave to these Hebrews, the people from Judah. 
The chief official gave them new names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he named Shadrach. Mishael, Meshach. And Azariah, Abednego. Their original names were actually Hebrew names that pointed to the worship of God. But their new names given to them in Babylonia were actually derived from the false gods. Last summer, we had a tragic moment in the Heller house. We had to put our dog of 15 years to sleep. I'll let you know, it wasn't as sad for me as it was for other members of the family. Not because I treated the dog bad, it just, we just didn't snuggle. Okay, I'll just say it that way. Not a huge animal lover myself, but, you know, I walked our family through this moment. Our family's dog's name was Shadrach. And so when I read this passage, I was kind of thought back. God rest his soul, rest in peace, our dearly departed friend Shadrach. I got to name the dog because I really wanted to name one of our three kids Shadrach, but my wife would not let me do that. Not Meshach or Abednego either. And so when we got the dog, when our kids were little, she said, here's your chance. If you want to name something or someone Shadrach, here you are. And so that's how it all happened. I always said if the dog found himself in a fire, the Lord was with him, but we'll get to that later in the book of Daniel, right? You know, these Hebrews, they really didn't get a chance to decide if they wanted to go to Babylonia or not. They didn't really get a chance on what they were taught. They didn't get a chance to choose their own names. But when it came to what the king was serving them to eat, they actually took a stance. Daniel 1.8 says this, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal feud and wine. And so he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. There were all kinds of reasons for Daniel to abstain. First, there was strict dietary laws that were found in the Old Testament law. And the food that was served in Babylonia certainly wasn't kosher. It was a common practice in the ancient world for food that was going to be served to the king to first be sacrificed to the idol or the god of that king and then served to the rest of the people. And so for Daniel and his friends to eat this food served to the king would be for them to participate in pagan worship. And they didn't want anything to do with that. There was also the risk that they would take of defiling themselves. And so what it says that they were resolved, they decided in their hearts to not defile themselves. There was risk involved in this choice, right? I mean, rejecting the king and the food that he ordered them to eat would be rejecting him. And Nebuchadnezzar wasn't known as the nicest guy. He wasn't known for his patience nor for tolerating insubordination. In one of Nebuchadnezzar's victories, when he conquered a king, he actually had all the king's sons brought before the man he had just conquered, and he had all of the sons executed right before their father. And then he gouged out his, the father's eyes, so the last visual that he had on this face of the earth was watching his own children be executed. That's the kind of guy Nebuchadnezzar was. And the risk that Daniel and these other three took for rejecting the king's food was that they put their life in danger. They also were going to be seen as oddballs. Everybody else was going to be eaten from the king's table, and that was quite a feast, let me say. And so they'd be seen as different, odd. They would miss out because these were some good eats. And they might not even be able to perform as well as the rest of the people because their diet was going to be different. And the person guarding them knew that he was putting his life at risk in the same way, he told Daniel, I'm afraid of the Lord, the king, who's assigned you food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. Well, there's another picture of the sovereignty of God in this moment. I think he was working on Daniel's behalf. Look what the rest of the chapter reads, beginning in verse 9. It says, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. And then Daniel said to the guard, verse 11, Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azrael, please test your servant for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with those of the other young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to do this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Some of the original language says they looked fatter than the rest of them. In the ancient world, that was something to be desired. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. 
To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his servant service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. A couple observations. First, Daniel and the three asked to be served water to drink and vegetables to eat. Now, this is not a biblical prescription for everyone to become vegetarians. Thank goodness, right? In fact, the original word translated to vegetables actually refers to any plant that comes from seed, not just veggies. And while choosing a more healthy menu, the wisdom, the strength, and the physical condition of these four Hebrews had very little to do with what they did eat. It had a lot more to do with what they didn't eat and why. And really, it was all because of God's sovereignty and his supernatural favor on behalf of these four. This won't be the last time we see the supernatural power of God show up in the lives of these four people. It's written all throughout this book. And I do believe that it was a direct response to their obedience to God. We don't obey God so that God will bless us. But God blesses us when we obey. That's exactly what he told Moses all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. In the face of extreme emotional, physical, social, political, spiritual pressure, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah chose to honor God, to remain pure, to obey God's instructions, to glorify him. They recognized where they found themselves was not their home. And even though they were miles away from their home, separated from their family and their friends and the ways and customs that they were used to, that it guided them spiritually. They remained true and faithful to God. And God gave them wisdom and knowledge and understanding of all kinds of things, the things they were supposed to learn and even more. And Daniel was given the ability to understand visions and dreams. And we're going to see how God put that to use all throughout the rest of the book. In fact, when they were examined and evaluated by the king himself, none of the others who had gone through all the pampering provided by the king held a candle to these four. They were found to be 10 times better than the others. When you read that 10 times better, it's probably a, a moment in the Bible where it's for emphasis, maybe a little, a little bit of even exaggeration for a purpose. On one more note, in verse 21, it says that Daniel remained in Babylon until Cyrus became king. We'll see why that's significant in just a few weeks, but let me just say for now, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't around in those times. Why is all this important? Well, we are exiles in a land that we cannot let feel like home. Our world tells us that we have to buy into the power structures and the systems and the way of life that exists all around us and find our place in them. Well, what can we learn from the life of Daniel about living in a land that isn't our true home? How can it help us live more faithfully in the world that we find ourselves? How can and should we live as people of God and navigate the decisions and the tensions and the realities of the world that we live in currently while reminding ourselves that we ascribe to the beliefs, values, and practices that are part of being the kingdom of God? We must live our lives recognizing that this isn't home. Well, how do we do that? Well, from this very first chapter of Daniel, I think there's three things we can do. And the first is this. We have to recognize who is really in charge. Nebuchadnezzar had all kinds of power, but he wasn't in charge. He may have thought that he was calling the shots and bringing home the trophies, but it was actually all because of God's plans in action. Daniel wasn't even in charge. He could have tried to take control and think that he was in charge. He could have abandoned everything that he knew that was true about God because of the circumstances he found himself in. He could have doubted God's goodness and his plans. He could have given in to all the pressures and customs of his new surroundings. He could have found his identity and fulfillment in the things that were being offered to him. Everybody else was, but instead... He chose to remember whose he was. 
I may have told you this before, but every time my daughters used to go out on dates or with friends, and even to this day, even though they're now 21 and almost 27, I still say that phrase to them. Hey, remember whose you are. And I had to explain to them early on what I meant by that. They do not belong to me. I'm entrusted with their care as their father and as a spiritual shepherd in their life, but they belong to God. And that's who I wanted them always to remember. They represent anywhere and everywhere. And so that just became a little lingo for us. Hey, remember whose you are. My daughter turned 21 last week. I said, hey, just remember whose you are. It's not a, out of judgment. It is a, a warning and a caution to her to, to remember that there's one person to please, and that's her heavenly father. No matter where Daniel was, regardless of what was going on around him, what others were doing, he remembered his creator. He remained faithful to God's instructions, and he rested in God's sovereignty. He confidently knew that God was with him. He trusted God's word. He fully obeyed God's instructions, and he allowed God to work in and through him. And that wasn't conditional to where he found himself living at the time. You know, something I didn't mention from verse 2 is the, worst, the use of the word Lord. It's not the typical just Jehovah God. It's actually the name of God that speaks that all dominion, all power, all authority belong to him, to him alone. It speaks of his sovereignty. That's who's in charge at all times, in all circumstances, no matter where we are or who we are. Remembering whose we are allows us to live for him no matter where we are. The second thing we have to do is remain pure. Daniel's a great example in, to follow in living for God no matter where or no matter what. We'll see this all throughout his life. I'm going to be very clear. I don't believe that Daniel was perfect, but he pursued perfection. Actually, better said, he pursued godliness. When tempted by the things that the world offered him, he chose to remain pure. Many see a powerful parallel between Daniel and another character we read about in the Old Testament, Joseph. They both found themselves in places they never thought they would live, places they didn't choose, places surrounding them with all kinds of things that were contrary to the way of God, and yet both of them chose to honor God. I'm sure you, like me, have found yourself in all kinds of situations where you could easily choose to not be integrity filled not do the right thing, to give in to the desires or the pressures that you feel going on inside of you. Maybe you have felt the pressure or even been pressured to misrepresent numbers on an account by your boss or a teammate. Maybe to take something that doesn't belong to you but that you could use or maybe you desire. Maybe it's to cheat on a test or to let chat GPT fill in your writing prompts or write your next paper for you. Maybe it's to not tell the truth or stand for the truth in a situation. Or it may be crossing lines sexually with somebody that you're not married to. or Maybe you're not even married at all. Who we are in every situation really matters. No matter where we find ourselves, it's really important. Who we are in every situation is a reflection, a reflection of who really is in charge of our life. And again, let me quickly remind all of us that none of us are perfect. But let's quit using that as a very lame excuse for not trying to be perfect. God's grace is what saves us. And his grace should motivate us to stop sinning so much, to sin less, to try not to sin at all. The people of Israel and Judah might have found themselves in a different place had they tried living that way. So let's live up to the high calling that we've received from God himself, who said, be holy because I am holy. Daniel was in Babylon, but he was not of Babylon. We are living in this world, but we are not of this world. Peter goes on to say these words, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, that's how he describes us, live, do, abstain from the sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, Peter says, that they may accuse you of doing wrong, make fun of you for the way that you're living, ignore you or leave you out because of the things that you choose. But when Jesus comes back, they will glorify God on the day he visits us, Peter says. We have to recognize who's really in charge. We have to remain pure. And I think we also have to realize the power of community. 
I believe that there's power in community. I think it's noticeable in this moment with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were able to remain faithful in a land that wasn't their home, I think because they had each other. God created us to need him and also to need each other from the very beginning. When we find ourselves in any situation or surrounding, I think it might be helpful for us to identify who it is around us that is truly pursuing God and and striving to honor him. And let that power keep us mindful of who's really in charge and to remain pure. We truly do need each other. It's not a sign of weakness. This is how God created us, how he designed us, and as well as his desire for us. I think each of us have to make our own decisions to honor and obey God. We will each be held accountable individually for the choices that we make and how we respond to the grace and forgiveness that's been extended to us through Jesus. No one else's faith nor the lack thereof can be cited as a reason for or an excuse for our behavior and our choices. But having made a commitment to following Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we can gain encouragement and support from each other as we walk this path of life together. We may be walking upstream. We must be going against the tide. We might be marching to the beat of a different drummer, but we will be doing it together, and we can find strength from that. Look for and connect with those who have faith in God and commitment to Jesus wherever you find yourself. That might be at work or in your neighborhood, at school, on your team, on the bus, or in your class. Not to the avoidance of everybody else, but to the benefit of each other as we remember who's in control and we also remain pure. I love what Solomon says. He says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. God and two people who have God as the center of their life. Here's the thing, the devil's really not changed his tactics. He's really not that creative. One of his major tactics is still isolation. If he convince any of us that we're the only one who, then he can find a foothold in our life. We have to have each other's back. We need each other. And like never before, we must stand in our faith together. We must encourage each other, reminding each other of who is truly in charge, what is true about God and his ways. We must hold each other accountable to purity as we walk this life together. And always remember that this is not our home. I'll just warn you that the book of Daniel is way more than any one sermon or a list of sermons could help any of us. And so like always, we want to provide you resources to dig into Daniel with us. If you go to cccgo.com forward slash info, You click on sermon resources there. There's a couple things you'll find. The first is a daily Bible reading plan through the book of Daniel that lasts for about 41 days. The sermon series is going to last about 10 or 11 weeks. That means you could almost do it twice, but it's available for everybody so that you'll at least get through it once. Get what I'm saying? 41 days to read through the book of Daniel. It will not take more than five minutes, even if you're from Kentucky and a slow reader, okay? I'd encourage everyone to join in with us through the YouVersion Bible app and read through the book of Daniel as we study through it. If you want to read it over and over and over, that certainly wouldn't be a bad thing. The second thing that we're providing there is a small group study. As a small group leader, you should have already got this information. If you lead a small group, whether it's part of Crossroads or not, we would encourage you to study the book of Daniel together. There's a video series. There's weekly lessons that go along with that. It'd be great for you to share with friends at work or a group that meets in your home or a group that you're currently involved with, or start a new group and extend that community we just talked about into the lives of others and study the book of Daniel. 
Also, the Bible Project is a great resource, and they've brought all of their resources about Daniel, which means videos and articles and things that you can read and watch all in one place. And if you go to Sermon Resources, you can click on there and find the Bible Project resources. And finally, we listed a couple resources that are great for young kids. All that, along with even two seminary-level studies of the book of Daniel, are available there. And I hope that you'll take advantage of them. All to help us realize that this is not our home. Let's pray together. God, we're here today surrounded by all kinds of things, all kinds of pressures, all kinds of temptations. And God, we have been called to live differently. That's been a call from the very beginning. Adam and Eve's flesh wanted that fruit, and yet you told them to abstain. God, fast forward to today. The world around us, there's all kinds of voices and pressures and temptations tell us to live a certain way, to just follow the crowd, to do what seems to fit in. And God, you're calling us to something different. Holiness, faithfulness, godliness. So God, I pray that as we look at the life of Daniel, we'll not just be inspired, but we'll be equipped to live differently, to remain faithful, to stay pure, to encourage each other along the journey, that we would realize that there is a day that we will be home, where there'll be no sadness or sin or death. There will be eternity with you. God, until we meet you face to face, may we live in love like your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray right now. Amen.